Be'ezrat Hashem, Na'aseh, V'Natsliach. I want to welcome you to another session of our Parashat HaShavua learning as we continue our in-depth learning of the weekly Torah portion. This week's parasha is Parashat Vayakel. Very, very interesting because as we said in previous classes, we are smack in the middle of this four or five parashiot envelope where the Torah discusses the Mishkan and everything that pertains to it, such as the articles of Mishkan, the, the gold, the silver, the copper, the wool, uh, all the things that, uh, that are, are going to be made out from it, whether the, the, the walls, the, the, the apparel for the Kohanim, uh, all the Mishkan, such as the Menorah, the Mizbeach, the Kiyor, etc., etc., etc. And as we're in this envelope of just uh, a constant review of all the things that are asked to be donated, things that are being donated, as, as the Torah gives us their purpose, uh, describes to us their role, we find, uh, we, we find ourselves in a, in a situation where everything is repetitive. So what are you gonna talk about? Try to find something that is going to be inspiring within the weekly Torah portion, even though that the content is being repeated over and over again, for several weeks. Well, Baruch Hashem, this week's parasha, we're going to go and take a deep dive into a gentleman, or shall I say a teenager, called Betzalel. Very, very interesting class, and Be'ezat Hashem at the end, we'll be able to also extract some serious life lessons, practical life lessons for our day-to-day -day life. Before we get started, I'd like to give some honorable mentions and dedications to the following people. Be'ezat Hashem, this class will be in honor of Itbarach Shemo Shalakadosh Baruch Hu, in honor of Jacqueline Bat Alia, Dova Shindel Bat Alta. Also, it should be to the Ilu Nishmat of David Ben Zohar and Yves Ben Rina, Michel Ben Zohar, Avi Ben Vivi, Esther Bat Alia, Avraham Yoshua Ben Sultana, Simon Ben Alia, Meir Ben Rebecca, Mazal Bat Luna, Sultana Bat Frecha, Yitzchak ben Sevilla, Nisim ben Meir, Rachel bat Bela, Yaakov ben Tamar, Susan bat Shaba, Yehuda ben Aharon, Brendel bat Meirdov, Shalom ben Zohara, and Hana bat Chava, Lehavdi. Be'ezat Hashem, the, 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 the Torah class also will be to the Refua Shelema, to Amram ben Zohara, Lavi Rafael ben Olga, Daniel bat Mazal, Miriam bat Pesi Penina, Pesi Penina Bat Brendo, Yaakov Ben Dina, and Keren Chava Bat Don. Also, the this class should be to the Zivug Hagur, Nishorish Nishmatam, to Inbal Bat Jacqueline, Guy Ben Dina, Shayna Henshi Bat Lea Gittel, Eli Ben Shula, Yehudit Bat Sarai Menu, Avigail Bat Sarai Menu, as well as to the Bracha Vatzlacha and general success to Abraham ben Daniel, ya, uh, Yosef ben Daniel, Abraham ben Vailot Chai, Yehuda Lev ben Tova Shindel, Desiree and Avia, Joseph Dornbush and the Dornbush family, Judah Mendel, and Judah Mendel also added an additional uh, sponsorship today as Judah is wishing for the release of all the hostages now. Be'ezat Hashem. Also, to Dov, Shmuel, and Pesi Penina and family, Shashem Vayechotem, Sameachotem, thank you so much for coming out. Thank you for uh, learning with us. I just want to add one more. Uh, we have a couple of co-sponsors tonight. Our, 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 our good friend of our class, Yudit Ben, uh, ben Shabbat. Shashem Vayechotem, Sameachotem, health, wealth, success to you, to your family, to your boys. Be'ezat Hashem, you always be on the side of the giving as Yehudit not only learns with us, supports us, but also uh, comes and learns with us. Uh, and also to uh, a good friend of the class that has been coming for a very long time uh, with, a, a, with a very meaningful parsha for her on a personal level, Batya, uh, Batya Miriam, the Hashem Varechotach, Samechotach, she'll give you health, happiness, Sa'ata Deshmai Bechol Ha'inanim Be'ezat Hashem, uh, you get Hashem mimaleh kol mishalot hibech letova. And may Hashem fulfill all your heart's desires for the service of Hashem. Amen. And of course, all the people in attendance, Hashem v'echem sameach v'echem. Oh, and last but, not least, last but not least, for an easy end of pregnancy and easy delivery to 
Michal Naomi Batiael Shindo for uh, for an easy uh, uh, end of pregnancy and easy delivery, and also to the Bercha Batzacha to her girls Abigail and Ayala Bat Michal Naomi. Okay, very good. Let's get started. So, Parashat Vayakel begins with the famous Pasuk, Vayakel Moshe et kol adat b'nei Israel ve'omer lahem. Moshe assembled the entire Jewish nation and he tells them, Ele adevarim asher tziva Hashem la'asot otam. These are the things that Hashem commanded for you to do. Rashi, immediately, on the first Pasuk, tells us, Vayakel Moshe, that uh, Moshe gathered, assembled all the Jewish people. When? When did he do it? What's the date? Right away, he gives us the answer. Lemachorat Yom HaKippurim Kshiarad Minahar. The book Seder Olam brings it that Parashat Vayakel happened one day after Yom Kippur, one day after he came down from the heavens. Well, to put things into perspective, let's begin to go, to backtrack on how we got to this Pasuk, and then we'll move forward. As my, my, lately it's been a, a famous saying, we have to go uh, back a little bit before we can go forward. So I'm going to go back uh, just a bit in order to get context of where we are right now. So the Jewish people left Egypt. Once they left Egypt, they went through a 50-day process until they reached Mount Sinai. On Mount Sinai, on the 6th of Sivan was the given of the Torah. Moshe Rabbeinu, the following day, goes up for a 40-day process, going up for a 40-day journey into the heavens, where he was going to learn with HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the Torah. And he was going to write the Torah down and bring it down to the Jewish people. However, on that 40th day, as it says in the Pasuk, in last week's parasha, Vayara Ki Moshe was delayed for six hours. Their calculation was, I'll be back in 40 days. When he said, I'll be back in 40 days, they thought from that moment. He meant that he'll start counting from tomorrow. So this discrepancy in the time of the counting of the hours, they felt that he was delayed. And because he was delayed, it gave the opportunity for the devil himself to start tricking the Jewish people. As we know, what he did is he created the apparition of Moshe Rabbeinu in a coffin as he's dying uh, on top of the mountain. They're carrying him as if there's no longer going to be the leader of Moshe Rabbeinu. And because of that, they started to panic. And the panic led to, uh, 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 to a decision to gather gold and build a golden calf. As the golden calf was going to be the replacement of Moshe Rabbeinu. And we said that the reason why is because at the time when the sea split, or at the time when HaKadosh Baruch Hu revealed to the Jewish people the throne of glory, they had a glimpse of the throne of glory. And as we know, there are four images on the, th on the throne of glory. An ox, a lion, a vul uh, not vulture, uh, an eagle, and a face of a human being. So when they saw the face of the ox, they said, oh, let's create an intermediary for us. And let's have him someone that's not, that's not human, that's going to die like Moshe Rabbeinu. Let's have an intermediary that will always be here. Again, I'm taking the kaf's chut, you know, the benefit of the doubt approach. Obviously, what we know is that the, 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 you know, another layer to the story is that it was the mixed multitude, the Erev Rav, that used their witchcraft, their black magic, to create this Avodah Zarah. At the end of the day, they created an idol. Well, all that happened while Moshe Rabbeinu was still in the heavens. Once he came down... After the initial 40-day period, he broke the first set of tablets, and we had, and that was in Yudzain Tammuz, and Moshe Rabbeinu ended up having to go to the heavens for a second time, for a second 40-day period, where at that time he began to pray for forgiveness for the people. On the 29th of Av, on the 29th of Av, he came back to say, it seems like God is going to forgive us. I'm going to go up for the third time, for another 40-day period, to bring down the second set of Luchot. And that was from Rosh Chodesh Elul, the first day of Elul, up until the 10th day of Tishrei, famously known as Yom Kippur, 
the Day of Atonement. By the way, why is it called the Day of Atonement? Because that's the day that Hashem forgave us. And because that's the day that Hashem forgave us for the head, Ha'egel, for the, uh, the sin of the golden calf, Moshe Rabbeinu came down with the second set of Luchot. And now, after this 120 day period that we just discussed, we come to the first Pasuk of Parashat HaShavua. Vayakhel Moshe et kol adat b'nei Yisrael. Moshe assembled all the Jewish people and he tells them, this is what Hashem commanded you to do. Rashi tells us, Moshe, when did he assemble the Jews? The following day after he came down from the heavens, after, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the following day after Yom Kippur, when he came down from the heavens. Makes sense? Chronologically, you know, we know where we're at? Great. Now, now that we know where we're at and what happened, we can see that it goes to the, uh, uh, the, one of the opinions that we had last week of why did HaKadosh Baruch Hu build, ask the Jewish people to build the Mishkan? Was it always part of the Torah? Was it always the, uh, something that was going to be part of, uh, uh, of the plan? Or is it because the, 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 the Mishkan was, uh, its purpose was to atone for the sin of the golden calf? Well, if we go according to the Mishkan being the vessel, being the, the spiritual accessory, being the apparatus that, that atones for the sin of the golden calf, we can see that the rest of the parasha is going to make a lot of sense for us. Because Moshe Rabbeinu is right now telling the Jewish people, start to gather, start to collect all the things that we need, all the things that we need for the construction of the Mishkan. The gold, the silver, the copper, the wool, the crimson, the, uh, the wood. Uh, and he started to uh, ask people to volunteer. And as people are beginning to donate, and people are donating at a fast pace, so, so fast that they actually have to be stopped, And Moshe Rabbeinu, in the third Aliyah, in Perk Lamed, Hei Pasuk Lamed, gathers the Jewish people once again. And he tells them, Vayomer Moshe Ben Yisrael, Re'u. Moshe Rabbeinu tells all the Jewish people, take a look. Kara Hashem b'shem b'tzalel ben Uri ben Chur l'matei Yudah. HaKadosh Baruch Hu has called, has proclaimed that there should be one individual by the name of Betzalel, the son of Uri, who is the son of Chur, that comes from the tribe of Yehuda. And this gentleman, this person, Betzalel, ve'imale oto ruach elokim, and HaKadosh Baruch Hu filled him with a godly spirit. Bechokma, bitvuna, uvdat, ubechol melacha. And he filled them with godly spirit, but also with wisdom, with insight and knowledge. And he's able to, he has an incredible amount of knowledge for every single type of craft. That he's able to weave designs, to work with gold, to work with silver, to work with copper. And he's able to be a stone cutter, he's able to set. Uh, do wood carvers, he, he's able to perform every craft and every design. HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave him the ability to do all that as one single individual. A, ma uh, uh, a master, uh, I'm sorry, uh, what do they call that? Uh, uh, a, jack of, a jack of all trades, right? They say a jack of all trades is a master of none, right? Not for Betzalel. Not for this guy. He knew everything perfectly inside out on the holiest level. And above and beyond that, and it says, And he gave him the ability to teach, not only to himself, but to another gentleman called Aholiyab, who is the son of Ahisamach from the tribe of Dan. 
ומילא אותם חוכמת לב ועשות כל מלאכת חרש וחושב ורוקם בית חן ואגמם תולעת שני בשש ואוהל ועושה מלאכה וחושבי מחשבות and he filled them with a wise heart to do every craft of the carving, of the weaving, of any type of design even embroidery with turquoise, purple, scarlet wool, linen and the weaver and the artisans of every craft and the makers of design in other words, HaKadosh Baruch Hu picked out Betzalel He gave him an assistant called Ahuliham, and there, th- those two individuals are also going to uh, serve as master teachers to so anybody else who wants to uh, get involved in helping the building of the Mishkan. So, right away, when you start to highlight one individual, and he, he stands out to be so special, the question is why? Why this guy? Why Betzalel? What is so unique to him? Not only that, he got chosen by God. He got appointed by Kadosh Baruch Hu. So we have to go and, 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 and dig deeper and understand why did Betzalel get this honor? Why was he chosen? And why was he given this incredible gift of just being a master craftsman for every single thing? What was so unique to him? Not only that, there's millions of Jews right now. Surely you can find your top 100, top 1,000, good craftsmen. Why does it all have to lie into the hands of just one? What is so unique and special about Betzalel? Well, before we get to some of the deeper answers, let's do pshat. Let's just do the simple understanding in regards to the Pesukim that we just read. If you recall, we started with Pasuk Lamen that says that Moshe called the Jewish people and it says, Re'u kara Hashem b'shem b'tzalel. He tells them, come and look. I want you to see the person that HaKadosh Baruch Hu appointed. And he is B'tzalel, the son of Uri, the son of Chur, who comes from the tribe of Yehuda. So what is the Jewish people supposed to see? So it's very interesting. Masechet Brachot on the 55th side, on the 55th page says that the reason why Moshe Abenu called the people to take a look at Betzalel, he wanted to ask for their opinion. What do you think, guys? Is this a good guy? Should we appoint him? It says, Sha'ala Moshe, Hehagun Betzalel Be'enechem, Shemanim Pernas Alat Sibur Midatam. Because you can't appoint somebody that works with the public, if he's not liked by the public. So Moshe Rabbeinu said, HaKadosh Baruch Hu appointed Betzalel, but I'm asking you, do you approve? Do you uh, agree with this appointing of uh, Betzalel to this position? Very interesting approach. In a little bit, we'll see why it's so important that he did that. Furthermore, When Moshe Rabbeinu says, Re'u kara Hashem b'shem b'tzalel, he says, come look, God has chosen this gentleman named B'tzalel to do all the work in the, in the, in the, in the Mishkan. Why would that be? Because, uh, and this is the opinion of Emek HaDavar, it says, She'i evshar lebinyan le'asot im lo al yedem mi shemelo ha'kadosh baruch hu chukma u'tvuna. He says, whatever Hashem wants from us, as far as Uh, whatever Hashem wants from us as far as the building of the Mishkan, it's so intricate, it's so detailed, it needs a, a, a certain type of wisdom, it needs a certain type of, of, of knowledge that is not readily available for anyone. Only someone that Hashem appoints and helps him to be able to build that, that somebody who's going to be capable of completing the job correctly. And it says, and furthermore, because you can see that the Kadosh Baruch Hu is taking, he's very particular with who he chooses to build this building, with who he chooses to, who, to, to put all these things together, you should be very careful with the building, and you should also be very careful with the individual that was chosen. Furthermore, the Torah went to the extent to give us not just one, not just two, but three different levels of explaining the wisdom, the knowledge, the intellect of Betzalel. It would have been enough to say he's smart. 
He's chacham, he's got this, right? But the Torah went ahead and says that it says over here, Bechokma, Bitvuna, Uvedat, Bechol Melacha. So anytime that the Torah goes, uh, goes out of its way to add words, it's to teach us something. It doesn't just say it, it doesn't need to have, uh, you know, uh, uh, what do you call those? Uh, adjectives. No, not the adjective, but, uh, you know, when you use the thesaurus, what does it give us? Synonyms. synonyms. Right? It doesn't need to just add synonyms. It can just tell you one word and you get it. So what's going on over here? So Ayemek Adava continues to say, Keshem shenivra ha'olam b'shalosh midot elu Just like a Kadosh Baruch Hu created the world in these three qualities, which is chokmat, buna, dat. In a second we'll see what that means in English. Kach nidrash ha'mishkan li'banot b'shalosh elu Just like a Kadosh Baruch Hu created the world with Chokhmah, Tvuna, Vedat. Lamedat, let's see what it says over there for 31. Chokhmah, he filled them with wisdom, insight, and knowledge. Just like the Kadosh Baruch Hu created the world with wisdom, insight, and knowledge. Similarly, the Mishkan needs to be built with those three elements as well. V'kol ma shekatuv, she'yada betzalel tzare potiyot, she'nevru bam shamayim v'aretz. And it goes further to say, that Betzalel was on such a high level that he even knew how to use the Hebrew alphabet to create worlds. As we know, the world that we live in right now got created with the Hebrew alphabet. HaKadosh Baruch Hu spoke, he had 10 utterances, 10 uh, sentences or 10 words that he said, 10 utterances that he said, and the world got created. And the, uh, let's call it the program, or the programming code that God used to create the world is the Hebrew alphabet, the 22 letters. Betzalel had the knowledge of how to create worlds with the Hebrew alphabet. So when he says that he knew how to deal with the Mishkan because it used the same wisdom, intellect, and knowledge of creating the world, because just like the world got created with the Hebrew alphabet, similarly Betzalel had the same knowledge and same power. Furthermore, in Pasuk Lamed Bet, it says, V'lachashov machashavot. That he was able to ponder, he was able to think. Meaning you put something in front of him, and he was able to deduce something from it. Why is this important? L'achashov machashavot shelo niru kmotan, sheesh yaoda ba'even, ויש חרש עץ, אך בצלאל היה שלם בכולם. ואיבן עזר says, you know what? ולחשוב מה חשבות. He says, because you might have a master craftsman that works just with stone. And you might have a master craftsman that works just with wood. And there's a different one that works just with metal. And there's someone that just uh, works just with gold. And each one is a master at, uh, at, at their trade or their craft. ולחשוב מה חשבות, he knew how to work with all of them on the highest level. There's some people that are architects. They know how to draw the plans to a beautiful building, but they don't know how to actually put bricks together, right? H&M builders, there's two different people. The guy in the office is not the guy that's going to lay down the bricks. So it says, you know, each one has a different type of uh, intellect, a, a different type of understanding, different types of capabilities. He knew how to draw and he knew how to build. Furthermore, when somebody is starting to build something for the first time, even if it's his first time in it, what do you do? You give him the cheap materials to get started, right? Like there's some people that when, uh, when their kids get to the age mm -hmm. of driving, they don't give them the Mercedes, they don't give them the fancy car, they give him the, the Civic from 10 years ago, right? It's like that if he crashes, if he scratches, malish, you know, it's, a, it's an old car. We expect you to, do, to go through that, right? You don't right away give him the quarter million dollar Bentley and say, here, uh, sweet 16 uh, uh, present, right? But it was different. It says, Typically, an artist works with common metals, and after that, you give him gold to work with. He immediately knew how to be a master craftsman, a master artist with gold. Furthermore, 
Furthermore, since HaKadosh Baruch Hu instilled in him Ruach HaKodesh, which is something that is now on a high spiritual level, it's not just working with raw materials and being an amazing carpenter or amazing jeweler, but you got someone who's an amazing carpenter, amazing jeweler, a jack of all trades that is holy, that he has Ruach HaKodesh. So obviously it's two different levels. So how does a master craftsman that have Ruach HaKodesh, what's extra about him? He knew the heart of the person that donated, meaning the, the intention. Every single person brought, this one brought a, a piece of diamond, the other one brought a piece of gold, a piece of copper, a piece of, he touched it and as soon as he picked it up, he knew the intention of the individual and he knew exactly according to the intention of the individual, if it's appropriate to be used, not appropriate to be used and where to use it. He says, if the person's level was on a lower level, then he would use it on something that is not holy. Meaning they might have some uh, uh, gold that you will use for the altar, but it's not the gold you will use for the Aaron. And it's not the gold you will use for the menorah. He had Ruach HaKodesh. So he was able to discern as well on the donations that were given, where to use them properly. If we just stop here, we could say, impressive. What a guy, right? However, there's so much more depth to the story. There's so much more depth to the individual. And in just a few minutes, it's gonna get very, very exciting about Betzalel. It continues to say that Betzalel, Hayat Sa'ir, Betzalel, was there's an opinion that he was 12 years old and there's a, an opinion that he was 13 years old uh -huh. so imagine who we're talking about over here a bar mitzvah boy regardless whether he's 12 or 13 he's a young man and not only that at this young age he got incredible gifts from god at the tender age of 13. Ruach Eloki, Chokhmah, Tvuna, Dad. He got wisdom, intellect, knowledge, God's holy presence residing within him. Ruach, Ruach Elokim. The Abar Benel looks at this reality of how blessed this young man was, Betzalel, and he chimes in and he says, Teva Olam, the way of the world. He says, typically, somebody who's God-fearing could care less about being a jeweler, about being a carpenter. You know, usually when somebody is a, a God-fearing Jew, what does he care about? He cares about books, right? And on the other side, in contrast, he says, those that are very worldly, that know how to go out into the world to do commerce and they understand about fabrics and leathers and gold, typically those are not so God-fearing, meaning, you know, they're not uh, people of the book. You know, they're not uh, all day long learning. They're out there in the street uh, making business. Like, for example, you could see that some of the people that are not spiritual but are all about the mundane. Like, for example, we have people that are in, in science. Uh, you know, uh, uh, scientists, researchers, you know, you, some people hold them in very, very high regard in society, right? But what is their approach to God? Their spirituality is on an all-time low. There's some people that are in the, in the science world, in the medicinal world, in the, in, in, you know, in all the things that people are, uh, uh, you know, in, in research, and they get like such high accolades from society. But if you talk to them about Hashem, he knows nothing. He doesn't even care about spirituality. So we can see that there's two types of people. Some are certain people that are spiritual, and certain people that are more about the uh, about the physical, more more about the mundane. But Salel was different. Not only was he tzaddik gadol bedoro, he was a, a extremely righteous individual for his generation, and we know that his generation was dora dea. These are not uh, you know these are not no slouches over here. Dora dea, they're all like a level of prophets, and he was a tzaddik amongst them. As it says that his name is Betzalel, and what is Betzalel? Betzalel is you have to take his name and cut it in two. Betzel El, in the shadow of God. That what? That he had such wisdom and he had such amazing 
craftsmanship in his hands, that this is something that a person can only acquire if a Kadosh Baruch Hu instills in him Ruach the, Elokim, the, 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 the Spirit of God. And that's why he had an additional level of Chokhmat, Vuna, Vidat. He got a major upgrade besides being righteous, besides being holy. He got a major upgrade in his wisdom. And that's why he was so capable of doing it, where he was a master of the physical and the spiritual. Shiluv Nadir. It says an incredible combination of things. That we all, the last time that we saw something like that was Yosef HaTzadik. Yosef HaTzadik was the last example of such an individual. As we know that you're, when, when Paro laid eyes on Yosef, what did he say? Is there such an individual that the Spirit of God is within him? And that's the same words that we just used on Betzalel, that he has Ruach Elokim. So we can see that the last time we saw such a rare uh, individual, such a rare character that had all these attributes, both in the holy and in the worldly, was Yosef. And here Betzalel has it as well. Furthermore, remember we said, the Pasuk says, Ulhorot Natan Belibo. That Hashem gave him a special power that he can see within Belibo. What's Belibo? In the heart, Shirkol Ish. In the heart of every individual. So, what, is, what does that mean? So, Betzalel Haya Yodea Lachashov Machashavot. That he was able to discern the thoughts, the intentions of every donor when they gave the donation. If they had some sort of an internal intent, Betzalel knew exactly where to take that donation and put in the proper uh, utensil, proper uh, item in the, in the Midash. If a certain thing was appropriate for the Keruvim, for the Cherubs, that's where you put it. If the other one was for the kaporet, the other one's for the menorah, if, it, if the other one is for the, uh, you know, for the uh, uh, ornating of the altar, each one was, a, as it says, lehorot natan belibo. He knew how to look into the hearts of every single individual that donated in order for that donation to go to the proper place. So now that we saw a little bit about his capabilities, another interesting level, another interesting layer, which is very interesting, is his family tree, his lineage. Where does Betzalel come from? Who's his family? So this is, this is very, very uh, interesting. It says that Betzalel, was part of Moshe's family. He says when Moshe Rabbeinu brought Betzalel and introduced him to the Jewish people, remember the first pasuk in the, in the parasha, Vayomer Moshe Rabbeinu Yisrael, Re'u, Kara Hashem b'shem Betzalel, Ben Ori, Ben Chur, Lemate Yehuda. He says, look, Hashem called upon Betzalel, the son of Ori, the, who, who is the son of Chur, who comes from the tribe of Yehuda. Rashi tells us over there, you know who's Hur? Bena shel Miriam haya. Hur was the son of Miriam. So let's start putting the pieces together. Betzalel ben Ori. So Betzalel is the son of Ori. Who's Ori? Ori is the son of Hur. Who's Hur? He's the son of Miriam. So we see that over here, he's the great grandson of Miriam. So what happens? Immediately when Moshe Rabbeinu puts his sister's great-grandson in front of Amisel, Oh, inside job. Huh? The, the Levis get all the big jobs, right? Everybody, the Levi family gets all the position. Aharon, right? Aharon, Miriam's children, everybody. It's all your family. It's all your family. Right, Moshe? So look what it says. Bnei Yisrael Hashdubo. They suspected Moshe Rabbeinu of, of doing something, uh, uh, you know, fishy. Protects. <laughs> Protectia, as they say. Very good. He said Protectia, right? He said, no, no, no. How do we know 
that the Kadosh Baruch Hu told you Betzalel. Maybe it's a different Betzalel. Maybe you made a mistake. Yeah, God told you bring Betzalel. Maybe it's a different Betzalel. He says, no, that's why. And why, why would it be? Because you have a Betzalel in your family. So you said, oh, let me go bring the one from my family. That Chur is the grandfather of Betzalel. And, and Chur is also the son of Miriam. So it works out uh, nicely for you. That you have a Betzalel in your family. So Moshe tells the Jewish people, Re'u, look, this is not my decision. Lo midati bacharti Betzalel. I didn't, I'm not the one who chose Betzalel. Shakadosh Baruch Hu went ahead and took and uh, made an extra effort to, uh, to detail that when the time comes to appoint Betzalel, he said, Betzalel, Ben Ori, Ben Chur, Nemate Yehuda. These are the words that God said. Hashem chose him, not me. I'm not, uh, you know, I just chose any Betzalel from the market and happened to be my, uh, my sister's grandson, great-grandson. So that's why he took away from him the claim that, uh, you know, that he has some sort of a, a negia on it. And that's why the name is Betzalel Ben Ori Ben Chur Lemate Yehuda. Because if you notice in the Torah, usually it only goes back two steps. It says the name of the father and the name of the grandfather and there it stops. Here it went a little bit further, then went also to the, uh, to the to, even to the tribe, right? So it went also to the great grandfather and to the tribe. So why? On purpose, because they thought that Moshe chose, not God chose. There's a fuller lineage. Is this Is this There's a fuller lineage that explains. The Yehus, the progeny, the lineage of Betzalel. It says, Betzalel haya nechdo shel Chur. Betzalel was the grandson of Chur, which makes him Nin shel Kalev ben Yefune v'shel Miriam and Nevia, which makes him the great grandson of. Kalev ben Yefune and Miriam. So we see that who did Miriam marry? Miriam the prophet. Huh? Miriam the prophet. Who did she marry? Uh, Kalev ben Yefune. <laughs> Where do we know Kalev ben Yefune from? The Meraglim. Remember, there were only two good Meraglim, right? Two out of twelve. It was who? Yoshua ben Nun and Kalev ben Yefune. Kalev ben Yefune was the husband of Miriam. Furthermore, in Divrei Yamim, there's a pasuk that says, "Vatamot azuva, vaykach lo chalev et efrat, vateled lo et chur, vechur holid et ori, veori holid et betzalel." There's a pasuk in Divrei Yamim that says, "Vatamot azuva." There's a lady called Azuva, and she died, and and, and Kalev ben Yefune took another woman called Efrat. And this Efrat is the one that gave birth to Chur, and Chur gave birth to Ori, and Ori gave birth to Betzalel. Masechet Sota, on the 12th page on the first side, takes this Pasuk and gives us the full description of what's happening over here. He says, you remember, don't think that Azuva and Efrat are two different people. He says, when Vatamot Azuva and Vaikaflo at Efrat, it's the same person. Azuva and Efrat is Miriam. Oh. Meaning what? Azuva is a woman that's left behind. That's uh, Azuva is when somebody is uh, abandoned. 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 <coughs> abandoned. Thank you, Ronnie. Oh, she was abandoned. So it says, Beniket Azuva. Why is Miriam called Azuva? Why is Miriam, the sister of Moshe, called an abandoned woman? Shakur Azvuta. Everybody loved her. Nobody. Amazing. Kola Kavod. Who said that? You get ice cream on your birthday. Is that a Shemli Neder? Par of ice cream. That was an amazing answer. Kola Kavod. So it says, Why is she Azuva? Shakur Azvuta. Everybody loved Miriam. Velo Ratsuli Nasela. Nobody wanted to marry Miriam. Could you imagine? Why? It says, Why? Kiaita Cholanit. She was sick. 
she was sickly. Miriam would get sick. However, Kalev ben Yifune, hitchaten ita l'shem shamayim. Kalev ben Yifune married her for the sake of heaven. He saw that nobody was marrying her. Kalev ben Yifune said, nobody's marrying you, I'm going to marry you. Why? For the sake of heaven. He saw Bat Yisrael, the daughter of, uh, of Amram, the sister of Moshe and Aaron. Nobody wants to marry her. He says, whatever everybody's reasoning is, it makes no difference to me. I'm marrying you for the sake of heaven. L'shem shamayim. And Rabbeinu, the rabbi said in Midrash Rabbah, Shemot Rabbah, Efrat zo Miriam. Another name for Miriam is Efrat. Vema shenema vatamot azuva. So if her name is Efrat, so who, why does it say and azuva, the one that was uh, abandoned, uh, died? Kavanatam lomar shaita metzoraat umetzora chashuv kemet. Remember, she had leprosy. And when a person has leprosy, they're considered as dead. There's, the Gemara says, four people are considered like dead. Who are they? One of them is a leper. The Gemara says four other ones, and at a different time I'll mention what they are. However, since she was a leper, since she had leprosy, she's considered like dead. So that's what she's called Azuva. And later on he says that he married Efrat. By the way, stop right here. Right now we can come up with four names for Miriam. Who can give me four names for Miriam? Let's go. We have Miriam. Efrat. We have Efrat, Azuva. we have Azuva, and Pua. Excellent. You also get ice cream. That back line is uh, ice cream. Very good. No Thursday. Pua. That's her name. Yeah. But what is Pua? Pua is because she was the ma- She was one of the doulas, right? She was one of the mayaledot. Matriarchs? No. She was the, one of the midwives in Egypt. And, uh, and uh, Miriam and her mother Yocheved were called Shifra and Pua. Yeah. Why were they called Shifra and Pua? Shifra, her mother, because she would take all the cone heads and she would make them round. You know, sometimes babies are born with cone heads. She would improve the, the baby. Miriam was Pua. What she did, did hand over to it. She went, poo, 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 poo. And she was like, oh, could she go to the baby? She would count the baby. So Shifra and Pua, there were two two uh, midwives that, uh, that uh, served the community in Egypt. But beautiful right now that we say that we know. This is a great, great, uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, great question for the table on Shabbat. If you got a little kid on the table, give me four names of Miriam. That's good. And you get a hundred fish to kill, right? <laughs> Show me. It's a, it's a good one. It's a, it's a brain teaser. Now. So we see now the lineage of Betzalel clearing up a little bit. So we ask again, why does the Pasuk have to name the grandfather? Not only that, when when it mentions his assistant, Aholihav ben Achisamach Matedan, it only goes back to Aholihav, the son of Achisamach, that's his father, Matedan. Why did we have to go two generations back for for uh, Betzalel. It says, Because the Torah wanted to make a point that you know that the person that built the Mishkan is the grandson of Chur. Why is it so important that the grandson of Chur built the Mishkan? That's the big question. And from here, the class is going to go into a different uh, place altogether. Because now, we're going past the Pshat level. Now we're, we're moving the curtain, and we're going into the deeper levels of understanding this week's parasha. Why is it that Betzalel, the grandson of Chol, he, and only he, was the one that's supposed to build the Mishnah? Who, who is his grandfather, who is the son of Miriam, if you recall, a few parashiot ago, he was mentioned during the fight with Amalek, that when Moshe Rabbeinu had his hand raised to the heavens, praying to Kadosh Baruch Hu that we should win the war of Amalek, and Moshe's hands were heavy, two people stood by his side, and, and they supported his hands, as well as put rocks on it so it doesn't go down. And who were they? Aharon and 
אהרון וכו' תמכו בידיו מזה אחד ומזה אחד, זה יוצא אין ספר שמות. So the first time that we saw Chum, is we saw that he was helping Moshe Rabbeinu with his hands to pray during the war of Amalek. The next time that we see Chum, is he's mentioned in the sin of the golden calf. Because when Moshe Rabbeinu went up to the heavens, he appointed two people that the Jewish people can go to for questions. Aharon and Chur. Aharon, his brother, and Chur, which was uh, his uh, uncle. Or his nephew, I'm sorry, his nephew. He left him, guys, if you have any questions, I'm going for a 40 day spiritual uh, hiatus. I'm going to go with a Kadosh Baruch Hu, getting a spiritual upgrade. I'm bringing down the Torah. If you have any questions, please bring it to Aharon Kohen or to Chur. So, when there was a delay or a miscalculation in Moshe Rabbeinu coming down from the heavens, the Jewish people came to who? To Chur and to Aharon. And they said, we want to build a golden calf. What was Chur's reaction? Chur's reaction says, He stood up and he yelled, How dare you do a golden calf? Just 40 days ago, we heard the voice of God from the mountain. As soon as he resisted to their, uh, to their, uh, to their uh, request to create a golden calf, they killed him. They killed Chur. That's why in Masechet Sanhedrin, on the seventh page, on the first side, it says, Vayar Aharon, what was Aharon's reaction after they killed Chur? What did he do? He built an altar and he says, tomorrow there will be a holiday for God. What was he trying to do? Delay. Buy time. He told them, go to the woman and collect the earrings from uh, the gold from their earrings. Women don't let go of their earrings very quickly. Women don't let go of gold so quickly. Aaron had a plot. Go get the gold from the woman. By the time you come, it's going to be so late. We'll be tired. We'll come in the morning. Meanwhile, Moshe will come down. There'll be no cheta egel. And then what happens? Then uh, no harm done. Who is dead, but no harm done. However, they quickly collected. People right away gave. We know that Bilam's two sons had a special black magic witchcraft kishuf that they threw into the fire with the gold. It immediately became an Egel and Aharon's plans, even though they, had, they were good intentions, failed. So it says, The Pasuk says, Vayar Aharon. Once again, we see that, it, that we have to be very particular with the language. Aharon saw. What did Aharon see? So, so the Gemara tells us, Amar bi Binyamin bar Yafet, Amar bi Elazar, Ra'a Chur shezavuach lefanav. What did he see? He saw that Chur was murdered in front of him. Amar, Ili shama'ana lehu hashta, if I don't listen to them, they're going to do to me like they did to him. They're going to murder me. And he says, and I know very well, there's a rule. To answer your question from last week, Aaron says, I know that there's a rule. That if there's ever going to be a reality that a Kohen and a prophet die on the same day, that's a point of no return. Everybody gets killed. Hashem will never tolerate a prophet and a Kohen dying on the same day. Killing a prophet and a Kohen, there's no coming back from it, there's no fixing it. If they worship the Egel, you can do Teshuvah and come back from it. So Haram does one of these. It's either I stand up like Chur and get murdered, and then the Jewish people are going to what? kill a prophet and a Kohen at the same time, and they're going to be completely annihilated and they're dead? No. Or I let them, quote unquote, or let them worship the golden calf. The golden calf is the sin of Abu Dazara. 
They can do teshuvah. They can come back for it. Worshipping the golden calf, there's a way to come back. Killing a prophet and a kohen, there's no coming back. Yeah. And that was his decision. How did we know Hur was a, a prophet? Because they were all prophets at that time. And Hur ah. himself is very well known to be a prophet. Ah. Furthermore, he says, <laughs> so, so here we go. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, he says, because Hur, now, again, why are, we, why are we learning this whole story? Because we're trying to connect it to Betzalel. Let's connect it to Betzalel again. Remember, his great-grandson. HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, I saw your great-grandfather uh, get murdered. That Hu nirtzach b'masea egel. Ashalem lo sachar. I'm going to pay him a reward to Hu. Va'amanet nechdo. And I will appoint his grandson, Shivnet HaMishkan. His grandson is going to build the Mishkan. The grandfather stood for against the golden calf. His grandson is going to build the Mishkan. That's why he specifically was chosen. Because of what his grandfather did. What his grandfather stood for. His grandfather stood against the golden calf. What was the reward of the grandfather? That his grandson is going to build the Mishkan. That's the reason why the Torah says Betzalel ben Ori ben Chori. Want that extra mile? Want that extra uh, uh, naming? Why? To know that Betzalel is here because of him. Betzalel is here because of Chori. Beautiful. That is. This is something that's settling. This is a Torah that when you hear it, things fall into place. You understand how white things are. It's a, it's, a, it's a big simcha to have this. Now, just when you thought it can't get better, now we're going to go to the stratosphere. Buckle up, guys. I'm going to scrape you off the ceiling at the end of the class. <laughs> Only if it's quick and it's to the point. Yeah, I was wondering how you get the Ephrat part. Miriam, uh, uh, Zahova, and... Azuva. Azuva. Uh, what happened to Ephrat? What's, what's, what's in the Ephrat? Ephrat Ephrat is her. It's just another name. So that's her name. She has four names. Is there an explanation why she got the name Ephrat? Yeah. Um, you know what? There is one over here. I'll, I'll share it with you at the end, oh. if you don't mind. No. Shvile Pinchas chimes in on this. And we're going to go deep into a couple of Gemarot and to an Ariza to understand the reincarnation of Betzalel. And then we'll come back to the Pesukim and we'll try to extract something for our day-to-day -day life. Shvile Pinchas says, he quotes over here, Masechet Brachot on the 55th page on the, on the first side. We mentioned it before, but here... We're going to go a little bit deeper, a little bit more layers to the understanding. Amar Bishmuel, Bar Nachmani, Amar Biyonatan, Betzalel, Al Shem Chochmato Nikra. He says, you know why his name is Betzalel? Because of his wisdom. B'Sha'a Sh'amar Lo HaKadosh Baruch Hu LeMoshe, Lechem Olo LeBetzalel, Asa LeMishkan, Aron VeKelim. He says, when HaKadosh Baruch Hu instructed Moshe to tell Betzalel, go build me a Mishkan, also, build for me uh, the tabernacle and all the utensils for it. Halach Moshe v'afach v'amar lo ase Aaron v'kelim mishkan. Moshe went and he switched the order. He told him, no. For, uh, he, he went to Betzalel and told him, build for me the, the Aaron, the tabernacle all the tools that we need for the Mishkan, and then build the Mishkan. Betzalel comes and tells Moshe, Moshe Rabbeinu, Min hago shel olam, Adam bone bayit, v'achar kach machnis et tocho kedim. V'ata omer, yase li arun v'kedim u'mishkan? Betzalel gives him an answer. He says, with all due respect, Moshe Rabbeinu, the way of the world is first you build the house, then you bring in the furniture. You're asking me to build the furniture first, and then the house. If I'm going to create all these articles of the Mishkan, where am I going to store them? He says, are you sure that HaKadosh Baruch Hu told you to, to tell me that first I do a Mishkan, 
Then I do Aaron, then I do Kelim. אמר לו משה, שמא בצל אל היית וידעת. He says, you were probably in the shadow of God and you heard everything, that's why you know. That's why it's called בצל אל, in the shadow of God. Because how can you know that this is what Hashem asked? Because at the end of the day, I asked you the opposite. So why is his name בצל אל? Because he is like the one that was in the shadow of God. As if what? As if he was there listening to what God was telling Moshe, because he told him the complete opposite. Look at the wisdom and intellect that he had, even in the conversation with Moshe Rabbeinu. Now, that is just a quick explanation of his name. Betzel el ha'ita v'yadata, that you were in the, in the shadow of God, and that's how you knew the order of things. But the question is, why was he specifically chosen over all others? And for, for this... So he was a prophet too. He had wisdom. He had Ruach HaKodesh. Ruach HaKodesh is when you have godly wisdom. The Hashem it, it gives you uh, ability to uh, have intellect and wisdom above the, the human level. He continues to say, Why? This is our, the original question that we had. The original question that we had in the, uh, in the beginning of the class but we're going to give a deeper answer. What did HaKadosh Baruch Hu see that he chose to, uh, to ch that he chose B'Tzalel above and beyond all the righteous Jews that were available at that time in the desert? People that were God-fearing, people that were holy. Why specifically B'Tzalel, the young B'Tzalel, the Bar Mitzvah boy B'Tzalel, that he gave him the Chokhmah and he gave him the wisdom to eat and, and, and the intellect and the capabilities to build the Mishkan? So Midrash Shemot Rabba gives an answer. It says, "B'sha'ah shebikshu Yisrael avod avodat kochavim, natan avshor al Kadosh Baruch Hu velo nicham." He says, "Chur, when the Jewish people, when the people wanted to worship the golden calf, Chur did not allow it. He gave up his life in the honor of a Kadosh Baruch Hu." And he fought against them not to build the golden calf. And what did they do? They overpowered him. Amdu v'hargu. They stood up and they killed him. Amar lo HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Chayecha shani upore alecha. HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, I'm going to pay you back. For what you did, that you stand up, you stood up for me. You stood up for the Torah. You went against the building of the golden calf. I promise you that I'm going to pay you back. How's he going to pay him back? Amar lo, Chayecha, Kol banim ha-yutzim imcha, Ani megadelam shem tov ba-olam. He says, all the children that are going to come out from you are going to come out and I'm going to elevate them to have a good name in society. Shenemar, Reu, Kara Hashem b'shem b'tzalel v'elmale oto ruach elokim. And here, once again, is the original pasuk. What's the original pasuk? That it says, again, there's, there's a proclamation. Moshe Rabbeinu comes and says, Oh, look! Like, it's like you're announcing, you're presenting everybody. Look at this individual. Look at the name. God chose him. That's elevating a person's name in society. It's elevating his status. That is part of the promise that God made to Hu. He said, you fought for my honor. I'll make sure to elevate the honor of your children and your children's children in the world. kara Hashem b'shem Hashem called on B'Tzalel, v'yimale oto ruach elokim, and he filled him up with the spirit of God, with his, the holiness of God. He continues to say, there's several other reasons why HaKadosh Baruch Hu chose B'Tzalel. Even though that we could stop right here, right now, and say, you know what, we understand, because he was the grandson of who stood up against Heta Egel, he got the honor as a grandchild. Right here, it's good enough. We could stop here, and it's a good answer. And we could go in a completely different direction and learn something else. But there's more beneath the surface. There's way more. It says that the Jewish people had a hard time believing that the Mishkan was going to atone for the golden calf. Meaning it was sort of like they knew it was such a big sin 
they snapped out of it. You know, they they had a a, a, a lapse in their spirituality, that a lapse in their avodat uh, Hashem, and you know. When Moshe Rabbeinu came down from the heavens the first time, they were mitzachakim. They were laughing. There was a party. There was dancing. There was all promiscuity. All the different things happening. When Moshe Rabbeinu came down for the third time, they were trembling. They were shaking. It was in the middle of the night. They were worried. Did Hashem forgive us? Did we get the Torah? Did we get the second luchot? It was a completely different mindset that the Jews were in. So when Moshe Rabbeinu says, "I came down. Start collecting." For the Mishkan, the Mishkan is going to serve as a as a as a as a, a, a tool to atone for the golden calf. They weren't so sure about it. They weren't so sure that that how that works. It was difficult for them. That the that the big sin of the golden calf will be atoned by the Mishkan. So Moshe tells them, Re'u mofet gadol ze. He says, let me prove to you that you should believe that the Mishkan is going to be the atonement for the golden calf. Look at how great God is that He's sending you a message and you don't get it. Shelo b'chay Hashem imi she'asei ha-Mishkan ela betzalel, ben beno shelchu. Isn't it ironic that the person that God chooses to build the Mishkan to atone for the golden calf is the grandson of the one that you killed because of the golden calf? Isn't that a message to you that he's forgiving you? That his grandson is here to atone for what you did to his grandfather? You killed his grandfather because he didn't want to do the Egel. This is a sign for you to see that the Mishkan is going to be the one that atones for the sin of the golden calf. He says, because the prosecutor is becoming the defense attorney. Who was the prosecutor? Chur and Cheta Egel. Who was the, now the defense attorney? Betzalel with the building of the Mishkan. How did you ask question in the beginning? How did you ask that question before, like, why you chose him? They already know why, basically. Because they're embarrassed. Oh, okay. They're embarrassed. It's not Imagine. The, the whole thing of the golden calf, it's like the air is thick with the sin of what happened. 120 days, I mean 80 days they're waiting for Moshe. What's going to be? Hashem going to forgive us. Oh, how do we mess up? We have to do Teshuvah. Moshe comes, he says, collect. And all of a sudden, he, to your point, this one. Oh my God, we killed his grandfather. 80 days ago, we killed his grandfather. Because of the Egel. And now he's putting them in front of us and oh, it's so embarrassing. And he's going to build the Mishkan. Moshe tells him that's the point. That's to show you that Hashem has forgiven you for the Egel. Because the guy, the, 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 the guy that you killed for Cheta Egel, here's his grandson who's going to build it. The Katigor becomes Sanigor. Furthermore, it gets better. It says, remember, when we appoint somebody to work with the public, he has to be chosen. You can't just force somebody on the public, right? He has to be chosen. He has to be liked. He has to be wanted. That's why when, even though Kadosh Baruch Hu says, I give you Betzalel to be the one who's going to build the Mishkan and everything in it, but Moshe put him in front of the Jewish people to do what? That they agree to it as well. They don't have an objection to his appointment to that position. Why would that be? So it says, Do you see him as a worthy uh, appointee to this position? So the Jewish people tell him, If before the Baruch So the Jewish people are answering him, If he's worthy in the eyes of God, and if he's worthy in your eyes, isn't it obvious that he's going to be worthy in our eyes as well? Why are you asking us? So, Hatam Sofer says something incredible. He says that the kapara, the atonement for Cheta Egel, he says, Kamash Malan Koshikin Deni Chaleu Dehavel Kapara. He says, the kapara, Hirak Betna Shotzim Israel Bebizyonam Shel Kapara. 
meaning some, part of the process of atoning for the golden calf is that they need to be embarrassed that they did it. There has to be a level of embarrassment, busha, that you sinned like that. So how would they be embarrassed? Let's say if you just put Ploni Ben Ploni, just a random guy to build a Mishkan. Great. Who cares? It's a regular guy. But when you put the grandson of the guy you murdered because of, the, of Mishkan, how do you feel? Embarrassed. So why he say? He says, uh, I'm going to put him. Are you okay with it? Because why? The embarrassment is going to help you kapara. They say, yes, we want to be embarrassed. We want to feel the, the, the embarrassment of, of having the grandson of who we murdered be in front of us. Hatam Sofer says, the kapara is betnai. The only way that the, the atonement for the golden calf is going to happen is on the condition, on the stipulation that the Jewish people want the embarrassment that comes along with it. And that's why he's there. Because Betzalel, and only Betzalel, can cause the embarrassment to, uh, to, to uh, help the Teshuvah process to be, uh, to be effective. Another layer of why specifically him. Can't be anybody else but Betzalel. You know, you read the Pesukim, oh, it's a teenager that knows how to work with, uh, you know, it's very handy. No, 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 no. No. There's way more happening here. And there's more. It says, Hagun Alechem Betzalel. It says, that, uh, is he worthy for you as a person to be appointed in this specific position and have caused you embarrassment? He says, Adraba, Mitam Zehem Rotsi Beminu He says, even more so, it's, it, this is exactly the reason why they want him and only him. The part of the atonement process for the golden calf will come through embarrassment and humili humiliation, which will be looking at that uh, child that his grandfather was killed because of that. That helps the atonement process. Furthermore, the Arizal now is going to reveal to us why it had to specifically be Betzalel and no one else. It says, Chur, the grandfather, was reincarnated in Betzalel. It says, Chur was reincarnated in front of Betzalel. Nitgalgel nishmat Chur be Betzalel, veyadua ki hagilgul nikra ben. So when he says, Reu kara Hashem b'shem Betzalel ben Uri ben Chur lematei Yehuda, v'yimale oto ruach, Elokim bechokma bedvuna vdad bechom elacha. It says that when Hashem appointed Betzalel, it says over here, Vaymale oto ruach, and He filled them up with a ruach, with a spirit. He says, don't read ruach, read chur. Vaymale oto chur, and He filled them up with chur. The reincarnation of chur was put inside of him, and that's why Moshe Rabbeinu put him in front and says, Do you accept him? Why? Because you killed him. And he needed the Jewish people to say, yes, we were wrong then, we're right now. Now we want him. Before we killed him because he represented going against the golden calf. Moshe Rabbeinu says, here is his son who is the Gilgul. The Betzalel is the Gilgul of Chur. Now I bring him in front of you. Hagun Alechem Betzalel? Is he worthy right now? And when they say yes, it's a tikkun. He couldn't right here because before they rejected him, now they're accepting him. Furthermore, it says, that if we take a closer look now, let's go back to the story of when they wanted to create the golden calf. Who were the players? When they wanted to create the golden calf, we had two players. We had Aharon, or we had the Jewish people. So we have the two people that are in charge, Hur and Aharon. And then we had all the people that wanted to, to uh, 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 build the golden calf, create the golden calf. So let's take those players and bring them back now to the front. Let's, see, let's deal with just those people now. Aharon is still around. Aaron helped, quote unquote helped. We know that he just wanted to delay. We know that he just had good intentions. Nevertheless, he helped with the golden calf. Hur is dead. 
But who is Betzalel? So what, I'm sorry, Betzalel and Aharon are both going to rectify Cheta again by one taking care of the external and the other taking care of the internal. Take a look at this. Betzalel and Aharon had a connection. Betzalel and Aharon had a connection in Avodat Mishkan. Betzalel is the reincarnation of Hu, and he died for Kiddush Hashem. He died for the sake of heaven. Why? To prevent the Jewish people from uh, worshipping the golden calf. He died for God. That's why he merited to have the role of building the Mishkan and all the articles within it. Because it atones for Cheta Egel. That's why he merited. That's why he had the Zechut. That's what we said out of all the people in the desert. Why only one gets all the credit, gets all the abilities, gets all the wisdom, gets all the Ruach HaKodesh. You know why? Because he stood up. And Cheta Egel, he gets the Zechut. Aaron, that made the golden calf in order to save the Jewish people from annihilation, he merits to do the work inside the Mishkan, the Korbanot. Why? for the worshipping that they did. So they see they, they also had like a, a, a dual, a dual uh, relationship, a dual purpose, a parallel uh, 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 role over here. Betzalel, external. Building of the Mishkan, all the physical parts to it. Uh, Aaron working on the internal, on the Pnimiot, on the Korbanot and everything that has to do with the Avodat Hashem. Both of them are atoning for the Egel. Betzalel is atoning because he... He, he gets the merit to build the Mishkan because he died for Cheta again, and Aharon gets to bring the animal sacrifices because he also saved the Jewish people from annihilation. Now, Khatam Sofer has a question about Aharon. He says, Aharon, isn't there a rule that when it comes to Abu Zarah you have to die? Don't we have a rule that there are three things that a person must do, that he ha must do, must die and not do? He says, Hello, Isu Abu Zarah, We have three sins that a person must give himself over to die and not perform them. Avodah Zarah, Gilu Arayot, and Shichud Damim. You can't, if somebody tells you, kill that person, why kill you? You gotta go. You can't kill somebody. If somebody tells you, worship, you know, bow down to this Avodah Zarah, I'm sorry, I can't. If they have to kill you for Avodah Zarah, you have to kill for Avodah Zarah, you have to die for Avodah Zarah. The other one, if a person tells you you have an illicit relationship, one of the 16 or 17 different relationships that a person is not allowed to have according to the Torah law, you, a person die, dies and he doesn't transgress on those sins. Yes, sorry. So, so uh, when they tell you to worship, when, you know, to worship the golden calf, it's better to die than to allow it to happen. How did the Aaron think that he's going to transgress on this? Uh, on this thing, because, quote unquote, he aided, he helped, he gave the idea, he collected for the Avodah Zarah. So it's as if he was an accessory to it. That's what the Khatam Sofer is, is trying to ask over here. He has an incredible answer, incredible answer. And not only that, even though that he was an accessory to the building of, of the Egel, Begdola Mizo, even a bigger question is, and after the Chet Egel, he becomes the chief rabbi of the Jews. He becomes Kohen Gadol. How did he marry to it? After something like that, surely he can just go be a, a regular Joe in the, in the camp. How do you elevate him to be to the highest level of, of, the, of, uh, of uh, Kwa, Kwa, uh, the Kehuna? So the Hatam Sofer some, says something incredible. He says, Yes, Mesirut Nefesh. Meaning, what's Mesirut Nefesh? The word Mesirut Nefesh is when you give yourself over, when you're willing to give your life over 
for Hakadosh Baruch Hu, for Kedusha Shem, Mesirut Nefesh, right? When you're 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 fully committed to Hakadosh Baruch Hu, to the point that you're willing to to die for Him, living a life that you're willing to die for, meaning living a Jewish life that whatever Hashem says, you're willing to die for it, and that's Mesirut Nefesh. He says that's when a person is, is, is able to give over not just his physical side, Mesut Nefesh, willing to die for Kadosh Baruch Hu, but also to give away the spiritual side of him to Kadosh Baruch Hu. Meaning, when somebody is willing to not only lose his body, but actually lose all his spiritual reward for the next world. Oh. I'm sorry, Aaron. What did he do? He says, I know that Chet HaEgel is so big that physically dying is nothing. I'm willing to do what's Mesirut Nefesh? Mesirut Nefesh, I'm willing to give away my Olam Abba. I'm willing to, I'm willing to give my Olam Abba for Kadosh Baruch Hu, for the Jewish people. It's a different thing. Like again, Mesirut Nefesh, it's all about dying physically. Aharon says, I'm willing to die spiritually for what I'm doing right now. What a spin. We never thought about it that way. So look what he says over here. He says, if somebody does Mesirut Nefesh and he gives away only his body, if he dies for God, what did he lose? He lost his body, he lost his life in this world. But he still has what? Olam Abba. El, um, he says, so we should not call that Mesirut Nefesh. We should call it Mesirut Guf. We should body. We should say that we're that the person when a person is able to die, willing to die for Kadosh Baruch Hu, it's not the giving away of the soul. It's the giving away of the body. Mesirut Aguf. That a person gives is willing to give up his physicality for God, but not his Olam Abba. That's Mesirut Nefesh. The Chatam Sofer over here is saying, let me redefine Mesirut Nefesh. Mesirut Nefesh is somebody who's willing to give away his afterlife for God. That's Mesirut Nefesh. Somebody who's just willing to physically die for Kadosh Baruch Hu, that's Mesirat Aguf. And he says, and that's what Aharon did. Aharon gave him Mesirut Nefesh. What type of Mesirut Nefesh? Khatam Sofer Mesirut Nefesh. The one that he's able to give away his afterlife. He's willing to give away his afterlife for the Jewish people. He's willing to give his afterlife for the, uh, for, for the, for the sake of God. So we see that Betzalel, who is the reincarnation of Hu, who, who, what did he really give? He gave his body, Mesirut Aguf. And that's why he was, he got the merit to build the body of the Mishnah. However, Aaron, he gave his Nefesh, he gave his afterlife, he had Mamash Mesirut Nefesh. And because of that, that's the inside of a person, that's the Pnimiut. And that's why he was merited to do the work of inside the Bet HaMikdash, because he was saving the Jewish people's soul from being annihilated. So here we finish the deep, the deep learning about Betzalel, the reincarnation, his role, his lineage, his family tree, why him specifically. And it's great. But I can't walk out of a class until I know that I'm learning from this something as soon as I walk out that door. What's my practical lesson of Betzal El? So I started to think about it. And I started to, to think that there's a running theme, not only with Betzal El, but in a few minutes, you'll see that there's a running theme in the Torah. If you zoom out and try to see what's the takeaway, what is the item about Betzalel, the Torah lesson that we're trying to do, to try to extract, there's a few. The first one that jumps out at us, because it's Mamash Pashut, because of the Pasuk, is that there's a concept called Shut Avot. Now when you have a good father, and when you have a good grandfather, you get to merit to good things to happen to you. It's so important to come from a good lineage. It's so important to have a father that's a tzaddik. It's so important to have a grandfather that's a tzaddik. Why? Because in their merit, good things happen to you. We saw over here, Betzalel, his grandfather, Chur, 
He was willing to die for it. And what did he get? He got such an honorable, honorable role in building of the Mishkan. So how appreciative we should be if we already come from a lineage of the Yehudim Ksherim, father, grandfather, or great-grandfather, even if it skipped a generation, even if somebody left, come back, whatever it is, that you come from a lineage of, 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 of greats, you have a schut avot, the merit of the forefathers. Now, if you don't have that, get started. Be the first one. You got kids. You got kids. They're going to grow up. They're going to be 20, 30, 40, 50. They're going to who knows what they're, they're going to be on. And maybe they're going to need something. It's your child at the end of the day. Hashem needs to go back and say, you know what, your father, he was special. This guy was willing to die for me. Because of your father, because of your grandfather, you're getting X, Y, Z, one, two, three. If you already come from a lineage of tzaddikim, ashrechem, you merited your, uh, it's a gift from God. But if not, be the one. Get started. Be the first one in line to schut avot. That's why also when you connect to a rabbi, we're living in day and age of a lot of balet tshuva. I myself am a balet tshuva. Speaking to the choir, right? Not uh, speaking from up top, I'm talking about myself. And, and we love the Torah. And it's great that we're able to learn it and teach it and, 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 and all that, right? But you, once you get into the Torah world, you get a great, great appreciation for a rabbi who's the son of a rabbi, who's the son of a rabbi. Was the son of a rabbi. It's different, guys. No matter how charismatic the speaker is, the schuta vote of that rabbi, lo. It stands for him for generations. That's why you see so many people clamoring to go to this rabbi who his father and grandfather were there just to kiss their hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go kiss that hand. Go kiss that hand. Go get a bracha from that rabbi. That rabbi is a schuta vote. That's number one. Secondly, this proves to us that there is a reward in this world. Yes, Sahar Ba'olam. There is a reward. Even though that we know that all the mitzvot that we do, we don't do them in order to receive a reward. We don't put on tefillin so Hashem can give us a lollipop. We don't build a sukkah so Hashem can fill up our bank account. We don't do that. We do it because we're commanded. Strictly the relationship of a master and a servant. Hashem told me, that's what I do. However, Hashem, with His great kindness and mercy, he rewards us, but there's, you know, there's a reward, and, a system of reward and punishment. Reward if you do good, punishment if you do bad. And we know that the reward for our mitzvot is not even in this world. The reward is the olam haba. Why would that be? Why would the reward be only in the next world and not here? It's because we can't receive such a big reward in the, in, in the state that we're in. Mm. Meaning, the physical limitations that we have as human beings living in a world that's governed by time, space, and, uh, and matter. The reward that Hashem wants to give to us, we can't even handle it. Not in this form, not in this, uh, not in this world. Only in a world where we're not limited by space, time, matter, and we don't have limitations, over there Hashem can give us the reward that is endless. It's like, uh, it's like imagine you go to Costco, and he says, Shem, okay, give me all my rewards for my mitzvot right here. He picks up like a hundred Costco's and drops it onto your head. Is that going to fit into a, a cart? And eh, we can't. We can't. We can only take dribs and drabs that Hashem gives us for the for we're here. But the real reward can only be really given in the olam haba. So, but there is a sahar. And we see, but there are some things that Hashem rewards us in this world. But B'Tzalel shows us there is a reward, reward in this world. But even more so, more than anything... And I'm sorry, but I am going to take about the next 10 or 15 minutes to unfold the next section because it's very, very important. Just one question to be clear. Betalel was already, he was alive when his, his grandfather was still alive when he was born? Yes. But you said that he reincarnated into Betalel. Yes, his, the spark of his father, came in, of his grandfather came into him. Ah. Spark. Gilgul. The running theme, the running theme in Betzal El and the running theme in the entire Torah is Mesirut Nefesh. What is Mesirut Nefesh? Self-sacrifice, total dedication, when you're able to live a life that you're willing to die for. That's Mesirut Nefesh. And if you look closely at all the stories in the Chumash, 
you see that every story that's in the Chumash, at the end of the day, the reason why I made it to the book is because it's another story about Mesirut Nefesh. Another story about Mesirut Nefesh. The more you look into it, the more you see it's all about Mesirut Nefesh. I'll give you some examples about Mesirut Nefesh. Let's start with Avraham Avinu. Avraham Avinu got... What did Avraham Avinu become famous for? When Nimrod threw him into the furnace. Right? When Nimrod tells him, bow down to me or I throw you into the furnace. Is that Mesut Nefesh? No. Throw me into the furnace. I'm sure Avraham had an incredible life story. His biography would be the bestseller, right? But... The stories that the Torah shares with us, the Midrash, says, the, the Gemara, they share with us, are all Mesut Nefesh stories. Pay close attention. When he was thrown into the Kivshan in Ur Kasdim, when he was a hundred years old and got circumcised, what hundred year old is going to go on major surgery at a hundred? That's Mesut Nefesh. When I tell him, you need at this age circumcision. Yes, sir, I'll be there in the morning. What? Most hundred year olds tell this in, I'm a little... I'm past that age, maybe maybe my son, right? And the Sirut Nefesh. When, when Avraham Avinu went to go fight the war, it says they went to the Michama with the four kings and the five kings. They went over there with 318 soldiers. Could you imagine fighting four or five kingdoms? And you're going with 318 soldiers? Rashi tells us by way of Midrash, it's not 318. 318 is Gematria Eliezer. It's him and Eliezer. Two people. Imagine two people going to find four kingdoms. Makes no sense. That's Mesut Nefesh. That's true, true confidence. Nakadosh Baruch Hu, that you're willing to die in order to do the will of God. How about Yitzhak? What's, this, what's Yitzhak famous for? Akedat Yitzhak. Imagine. A, t- a 37-year-old tells his father, tie me up good. Hashem says, bring me up a, as a sacrifice on the altar. That's a Mesut Nefesh. He's willing to die for Kadosh Baruch Hu. Pay attention to all the stories that made it to the Chumash. They all have Mesut Nefesh. Yaakov Avinu had a different type of Mesut Nefesh. Earlier this year, we gave a class about it. His Mesut Nefesh was about his kids. About his kids and being in the right environment, Jewish education, Staying away from Lavan, staying away from Esav. His job was, he had self-sacrifice for his children. The Jewish people in Egypt. This famous story of Shabbat Gadol, When they've been enslaved for 210 years. And Moshe Rabbeinu was telling them, we're going to leave. And you know what you should do? Grab yourself a lamb. Tie it to your bedpost for three days. And in, the, in, in three days, we're going to shecht it, barbecue it, and then we're going to leave. And all of Egypt, all of Egypt sounds like a, like a flock of sheep. Meh, meh, meh. And that was to be the what? That was the God of the Egyptians. The Egyptians coming to their former slaves. What are you doing? That's our God that you have tied to your bed. Yes, that is your God tied to your bed. And what are you going to do with it? We're going to shecht your God. We're going to barbecue it, and then we're going to leave. You know what type of courage you have to have? You've been an enslaved nation for 210 years. You know what type of courage you need to have to say that and be there for three days? Mesirut Nefesh, HaKadosh Baruch Hu never says, I'll never forget, B'damayich, what was the Damayich? The, 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 the dam of the Korban Pesach and the dam of the Brit Milah. The bloods, he says, I'll never forget your bloods. That you went after me into a desert. You went after, after Brit Milah and after Shabbat Gadol, you went after me to the desert. I'll never forget that. that I'll never forget that Mesirut Nefesh. All the stories in the Torah, Mesirut Nefesh, Mesirut Nefesh. That's what makes it to the headlines. There were many, many, many other stories, but that's what makes it. In the time of Yitziat Mitzrayim, so many people went, so many people went through the ocean. Who's the most famous guy that went through the ocean? Nachshon ben Aminadav. Why was Nachshon ben Aminadav the one that was mentioned? Because he was the first one. Huh? The Mesirut Nefesh. He says, Hashem says, walk. Where? The ocean. So there's an ocean in front of me. He walks, he walks, he walks, he walks. And then the water comes to the nose. He goes, Hashem HaKadosh Baruch Hu. He give my mad nafesh. If I take one more step, the water is going to go over my nose. I'm going to drown. Hashem says, all I wanted to do is see your Mesirut Nefesh. The sea split. Every single story is Mesirut Nefesh. The self-sacrifice, full commitment to Hakadosh Baruch Hu. Furthermore, 
Moshe Rabbeinu last week, also Mesirut Nefesh, above and beyond the Mesirut Nefesh that he had for the Jewish people. But when HaKadosh Baruch Hu tell him, tell him, allow me to annihilate this nation, this nation of sinners, these, these idol worshippers, I'll start over just with you and with your family. You know what Moshe says? Look at this total sacrifice. Erase me from your book. If, I'm, if it's not me and these people, erase me. You know what type of uh, approach, what type of commitment, what type of Mesirut Nefesh Moshe Rabbeinu had for the Jewish people? Erase me from your book if these idol worshippers are not going to be the nation that you forgive and lead us into Israel? Look at the stories that make it to the Torah. All are Mesirut Nefesh. I'll just go quickly to the holidays. We were in the, in the Tefillah class, we're talking about Hanukkah and we're talking about Purim. Great. Why do we celebrate Hanukkah? Because of the Mesirut Nefesh that happened the story of Hanukkah. As we know that Antiochus that evil tyrant, he wanted the Jewish people to stop keeping Shabbat, Brit Milah, uh, 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 sanctifying the moon, learning Torah as a religion. They can learn it as a, as a, as a philosophy, as a, as, a, as a book, but not as a religion. And he was successful. The entire Jewish nation assimilated or converted. Until comes one family, Matitya ben Yochanan, with five of his children, one family against hundreds and thousands of soldiers? Does it make sense that one family, it's like me and the guys over here, guys, let's go. It's us versus Canada. What? Who gets up? Makes no sense. It's complete Mesirut Nefesh. And that's the story of Hanukkah. That Hashem made the miracle. Every single thing that stands out in Jewish history has the running thing, the secret sauce, Mesirut Nefesh. Purim. Also, what's Purim? Purim, we know. Well, how they, we always know that we get into trouble somehow. But how did we get out of the trouble? Also, Mesirut Nefesh. What was the Mesirut Nefesh? Mordechai, while everybody's bound down to Haman, Mordechai says, no, not me. I am not bound down to, to Mordechai. Mesirut Nefesh. He's going to kill you. I don't care. I don't bow down to a Getchka. I don't bow down to a human being. Esther. She had the prohibition of seeing a Hashverosh. Anybody who sees a Hashverosh without being summoned, without being invited, death. What did she do? Mesirut Nefesh. My, my nation is in trouble. She goes without an invitation. Mesirut Nefesh. The Jewish people, the Jewish people, they, they have a, 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 a date of annihilation looming over their head. You think that they would convert, they'd say, oh, we all want to be mini Hamans. No, no, no. What did they say? They put on their tzitzi, they put on their kippah, they started to pray, they started to learn. They became more Jewish. But there's a, a, a looming annihilation of the Jewish people. Don't you want to run away from it? No, no, no. I'm running towards it. I'm running towards it. Mesirut Nefesh. I'm with God. But they annihilate Jews. I'm a Jew. Nebuchadnezzar, we know that he also, another evil tyrant that wanted people to bow down to the to the idol, and he put Hananiah, Mishael, Vazayat, Lakivshan. Also, they got saved. Why? Also, Mesirut Nefesh. So, when you're living a life that's worth dying for, you make it to the Torah. Who lived a life worth dying for? He stood up. No, not on my watch. Kill me, kill me. Every single one, every single storyline. In, that we just mentioned the Torah, every storyline in Jewish history, every key to success, every key to open miracles that we celebrate in every story, what was the magic ingredient? Mesirut nefesh. A hundred percent in, all in. That activates all the Yeshuot. I have to say that I hate to say it, but this formula also works on the dark side. This formula also works on the Sita Achra. It also works uh, with evil people. Mesirut Nefesh uh, is very popular nowadays with martyrdom. You know, like the Arabs, they Shmaidim, they call themselves martyrs. Martyrs in English is Mesirut Nefesh. They are also have Mesirut Nefesh. Why are they so successful? Why are they so successful? Why? Because they are 100% all in. They believe that what they're doing is right. Mesut Nefesh, even without the religion, has power. You should just know that, that when you are 100% about one thing, it carries a lot of weight. 
It carries a lot of power. That's but different. They might be, huh? That's different. These people are killing themselves and they're not allowed to kill themselves. It's a they're evil, they do wrong, right. but they are successful. They've been successful for many, many years. It's not it happens once in a while. Every few days, they, they, they kill a few people, a few more people, a few more people, a few more people. Where do they get this success from? Why aren't they failing? Because they're fully committed. They're martyrs. Mesirut Nefesh has power even, even in an evil way. But obviously, we don't want to end the night talking about the Ishmaelim. I just want to say that Mesirut Nefesh has power. And the lesson from Betzalel, the lesson from Chur, the lesson from every single story in the Chumash and in Jewish history is that Mesirut Nefesh is powerful and we need to activate it in our life. We're too much 50-50. We're too much, you know, last week's, uh, last week's uh, Haftarah, Eliyahu Navi tells them, how, many, how long are you going to be dancing on two parties? Yeah, huh? two uh, you, you go to shul and you got the getchka in your pocket. What are you doing? Choose a side. No more 50-50. You're religious or you're not religious? You believe in God, you don't believe in God. Why? Because 50-50 is no power. 99-1% is not powerful. 100 activates Messi with Nefesh. To be 100% Jewish is powerful. Powerful that activates miracles. And activates and gets God's attention. And comes with rewards. And comes with protection for your children and your children's children. It's good to know that there is such a concept as Mesirut Nefesh. And it works. And not only it works, it's our essence. Every single story that we've celebrated in Jewish history, running theme through the common denominator through all of them, is Mesirut Nefesh. There's that Hashem that we merit to Mesirut Nefesh on a personal level, to be fully committed to ourselves, to be fully committed to our personal success, to be successful in the morning, to wake up and pray, to study Torah, to do our share on a personal level that helps us obviously on a collective level. We should be matzlichim to stay holy, to stay off the phone, to stay off the TV, to stay off the social media, to work on it. It's a, one minute less a day, five minutes less a day, eventually you get there, it's our power. And to be one day mamash, a Yehudi, Living a Jew, a Jew living a Jewish life through his Jewish neshama, powerful, powerful, able to activate miracles in your own life by way of the teva. Hashem is looking, looking, looking for the next Mesut Nefesh hero. Our entire religion is is just you know trinkets of Mesut Nefesh stories. I, I challenge you to look at the Torah any any other way again both in a negative or positive way, you'll see anybody that made it to the book is because it's a Mesirut Nefesh story that God loves to share with us. doesn't tell us about uh, Abraham having a lunch by the seashore. Eh, that didn't make it. <laughs> but him fighting kings and him uh, getting a circumcision at 100 and him to bringing his son to the altar, Mesirut Nefesh, Mesirut Mesirut, hey, okay, you guys come. Is that the that we merit for our personal Mesirut Nefesh, our collective as Jews, when we get connected, when we are not only connected but united, nobody, nobody can win us. We have the magic formulas. We just have to know how to activate them in our personal life and collectively. Yeah.